Good afternoon, welcome, and thank you so much for joining the Florida Apex Accelerator at UCF for a, another webinar. Today, we are so excited to be hosting Dr. Tracy Boyd from the Central Florida Tech Grove to get us kicked off in our how to um, work with how to get started with the Cyber series. This is a three-part series, and we'll talk about the other two parts a little bit later and how you can engage with those. Um, but before we begin today's presentation, I do just want to go ahead and start with a little bit of housekeeping. So the first thing that you'll have noticed is that as you enter, you have a GoToWebinar panel that allows you the ability to see the handouts. There will be a handout in there that contains the copy of today's slide deck, and it also gives you the ability to ask questions in the chat box. We do ask um, that you ask questions throughout the presentation as we do have designated sections in which we will address those. Um, definitely would recommend that you do make those questions as specific as possible, just in case we don't get to your question right away on the topic that we're speaking about, when we actually do follow up, we are able to answer your question accurately and appropriately. The next thing is that we do have a feedback survey that will be um, given to you in the chat at the end of or toward the end of this presentation here today. And we ask that you please fill that out. Um, the reason being is that we are able to provide these no cost resources to you and to our funding partners. It is a uh, ability for us to be able to continue continuously improve and be able to show the work that we're doing here with you all and make sure that what it is that we are providing is actually helpful. And also, if you are not a client of the Florida Apex Accelerator, go ahead and scan the QR code um, and register today. There is no cost or obligation in order to be a client. It just allows you to be able to have access to our resources and also to meet one-on-one -on -one with a consultant to speak about your specific needs. All right, and then a little bit about who we are. So the Florida Apex Accelerator, which is formerly known as the Florida PTAC, is actually um, hosted out of nine different universities in the Florida um, network. Um, our state office is located in Pensacola at the University of West Florida, and we are co-located with the Florida SBDC network, which allows us to utilize the resources um, of both of them and be able to assist each other um, in different areas of business development. Our team consists of about 13 consultants statewide, and we are funded in part by the Department of Defense. And some of our core services are one-on-one -on -one no-cost consulting, training events and workshops, networking support, and researching support. And this is our lovely team. We have Steve South. He is our program manager. He is on the call here today. Um, we also have Kara Vernon, who is our procurement specialist. Um, she is also on the call today. Steve and Kara, do you want to just give a shout to the people? Hello, everybody. First time in my life I've ever been called lovely. <laughs> Welcome, everyone. All right, and then we have myself. My name is Kayla Gale. I actually am an SBDC associate consultant, but I work very closely with our PTAC, uh, putting together these types of events for you and making sure that they are what you expect them to be. Um, so we're so grateful and appreciative for your attendance here today, and we hope that you learn something. Um, so before we get into today's session, I do just want to briefly introduce our speaker who is Dr. Tracy Boyd, um, who is the Cyber and STTR coordinator and, and outreach for the Central Florida Tech Grove. Um, highly would recommend that you go ahead and take down her contact information to be able to reach out, ask any follow-up questions if it doesn't hit you today. We encourage you to stay connected with our network and we're happy to help you in any way that we can. But before we do begin, um, I just wanna start first to kind of warm up. Let me know if any of you have heard of the Central Florida Florida um, Tech Grove. And you can do so by just commenting in the chat, yes, no, um, kind of what that looks like. So go ahead and take a few moments and just let me know, um, have you heard of the Central Florida Tech Grove before? All right, we got some no's. Is Apex Accelerator for Florida companies only? And no, the Florida Network um, Services uh, Florida, but we have the Apex Accelerator is a nationwide um, offering. 
Um, okay, so we have most of you. It looks like most of us have not heard of the Tech Grove. Oh, someone said the Tech Grove is great. So that's awesome. Haven't heard of it. Awesome. So we're so glad that we were able to connect with you because this is definitely um, hopefully going to be a resource that's going to be very valuable to you moving forward, um, especially along your cyber journey. Um, and then the next thing that we're going to go ahead and enter is I'm going to send you guys a few polls. So don't be shy and answer the polls the same way um, that this is going to be a little bit different. So the first poll is going to be, do you have a cage code? Uh, so you have three options, either yes, no, or what the heck is a cage code? If you are in the third category, please do not feel ashamed. It is OK. We're here to make sure that we are able to educate um, if you do not know what a cage code is. So I'm going to go ahead and give you all a few moments. OK, we still have some yeses coming in. OK, we have some more yeses for they, that they do know who the Central Florida Tech Grove is. That's awesome. And it looks like most of you have sent in your vote. If you want to go ahead and send in your any last calls. All right, I'm going to go ahead and close out the poll. And I'll share the results with you all so we can just see what our audience looks like today. So 66% of you do have a cage code. So that's awesome. You are definitely um, on the right track. Um, no, if you don't have a cage code, that is OK. Um, the Florida Apex Accelerators are here to assist you. Um, and also, hopefully, today's uh, presentation will help you understand a little bit more about the importance of that. Um, and some of you are in that category of what the heck is a cage code. So please stay till the end. Keep on listening. And we will address that and make sure that you get some knowledge out of today's webinar. All right. And then we have one last poll. And this one is, have you been awarded a DOD contract? So that is a Department of Defense. Um, you can select yes or no. OK. All right, it looks like about 75% of you have put in your vote. I am going to go ahead and close out the poll. So this is the last call. Go ahead and cast your vote now. All right, and then to share the results with you all for this one, it looks like about 90% of us have not been awarded a DOD contract. 10% um, say yes. So. Thank you so much for engaging in this poll. Are you all ready to get started uh, with today's presentation? Go ahead and drop some yeses in the chat um, and let us know where you are and if you're feeling good about uh, joining us here today. I'm going to go ahead. Okay, we have some yeses. Awesome. All right. So without further ado, I am going to go ahead and pass it on to our speaker of the day who will continue our presentation, Dr. Tracy Boyd. Hello, everybody. Uh, I'm Dr. Tracy Boyd. I am with the Central Florida Tech Grove, and I am their CIBR and STTR um, coordinator, outreach, and house expert to help with all things CIBR. We also do um, other things for small business funding and things like that. And at the end, I'll show you how you can get all those updates. But first, we're going to talk about how to even get started with CIBRs or STTRs opportunities. It is not easy. Like a lot of government programs, there's a lot of steps. However, if you're tenacious, and I think everybody on the line is, then you will be successful. So one of the things about the CIBR program is it can absolutely fund your technology concepts. Because a lot of CIBRs are technology-based. So let me explain. Years ago, I worked for a company and they were doing um, in image generating, right? So they had a great image generator and it was able to interact with many other simulators. But there was a lot of different functionality they wanted to add to this image generator. They wanted to add um, a good physics engine. They wanted to add um, control measures. They wanted to add several different things. And one of the ways they were able to do that was through the CIBR program. So that funded innovative research for their image generator, which went back to the government, right? And the cool thing is, is they had built in clients. They already had clients. They had paid for the, the research and development and even the prototype. 
And then what happened is that they were able to move forward so quickly and so fast and they already had clients. So they were already selling image generators and they were able to add more and more and more capability. It's pretty impressive. So sippers are able to support your small business, which is one reason why I'm passionate about it. And you can automatically have clients like we talked about, and you can create some really great trusted relationships. So you can work with these clients, especially DOD clients over and over and over again. And a little bit about me, so you know who I am, is obviously I'm Dr. Tracy Boyd. I'm the Civer and STTR coordinator and outreach for the Central Florida Tech Grove. Um, I've done proposal, proposal management for Sivers um, and large DOD contracts and commercial contracts. Um, I have 20 years of experience with DOD contracts, um, architecture, design, um, even some programming in there and leading large technical programs. I've also worked with a few startups and done some smaller projects. I'm also a small business, small technology business owner, so I know where you guys are coming from, and I have experience with companies including Coca-Cola, Lockheed Martin, Deloitte, and I'm super passionate about helping small businesses find opportunities, helping them grow and flourish. To that end, why should you care about Sivers? Well, you care because you're here, right? Or at least somebody told you to be here, or you've heard the acronym. It means Small Business Innovative Research. And the Sivir program is a very large government program where several different government organizations, agencies have this a Sivir program, but they're different. Each organization has a different flavor of their CIBR program. So um, there's the National Institute for Health, there's the National Science Foundation, there's the Department of Energy, they have CIBR programs. The one that has the most funds available, the most topics, um, has the most consistency as far as how to apply, what it looks like, are the DOD CIBRs, which are mainly what we're gonna talk about today. But overall, um, the CIBR program gives about $2 million for research and development. And I believe that's yearly. No, no, it's more than that. I'm sorry, let me back up. You get up to $2 million for research and development on one CIBR award, sort of. So CIBRs have three phases. We'll get to that in a minute. But if you win all those phases, you can get up to a, about $2 million. Um, only small business qualifies. So there's a lot of eligibility requirements, um, which I'll, I'll tell you how you can find those a little bit later. But basically, if you're US owned, or I think at least 50 or 51% US owned, and you're under 500 people, you can qualify. In 2020, there was 3,802 3, awards. So there's tons of CIBR awards and 95% of those awardees had less than 10 employees. 81% were less than five years old. And they did 3.2 billion in funding each year. I believe that was also for 2020. That was the funding amount, 3.2 billion in the CIPR program. So that's, that's a nice chunk of change. Okay, CIPR 101. Um, they are research and development grants or contracts. For the DOD, they are contracts. For others, I think the National Institute of Health, it might be called grants. Um, they are to increase the United States innovation and to help small businesses. Those are, they have, there's several goals, but those are two of the big goals, right? There is STTRs also. You'll hear that a lot. You'll hear SIBRs and STTRs, or some people called SITRs. STTRs are Small Business Technology Transfer Research. <laughs> Basically what those are is that you work with usually university, um, and I believe it's 
that you partner with the university. You can partner with SIBRs too, but STTRs require partnership. There are three, I'm going to put a little asterisk by the three phases because I'll go over that a little bit more in a minute. But there's usually about three phases of SIBRs. There's a phase one, which is concept development, right, or feasibility study. It's usually, it says six months to a year. The ones I've seen are mainly six months, but this is for all SIBRs, not just DODs. Um, and it's from 50 to 250K that you receive. And then you have a phase two, and that's prototype development. Now this is normally, everything has an exception, right? But normally this is how they're supposed to work, is a phase two is prototype development. That is for 24 months, usually, and it's from 500,000 to 1.5 million. And then you have phase three, which is commercialization. And I'm gonna talk, I'm gonna give you guys a little brief on phase three, because it can get a little fuzzy. Phase three is not technically a SIBR. It doesn't come out of that SIBR funding bucket, that 3.2 billion, right? It is different. It is more about commercialization. So you've made your, you've done your concept, your research, your feasibility study, you've developed your prototype. Now you go into production or you go into commercialization where you sell whatever you've done to someone else or someone else is using it. Um, so that's the difference with phase three. So you don't actually do um, work through the SIBR program to get the phase three exactly. That's called a technology transfer. And there's other programs for that. So don't panic. But that is, it's a little misnomer that we call it. It's still a phase three, but it's a little complicated. For SIBRs, you have um, topics and there's also something called open topics now, which we'll get into that in a few more minutes. It's always a competitive proposal process and all of them do it different. The DOD is the most similar between all the different um, DOD organizations. However, um, National Institute of Health, I believe they do, you can submit anytime, but they do a review every six months. It's very different for each one. Um, so topics have a particular problem they're trying to solve or they need you to solve. Open topics are a more wide area of focus. So sometimes they can have something like um, human performance could be an open topic. That's pretty broad. And then um, each organization, again, as I said, has a different process. So if you're going to go after a SIBR for something that's not, you're not familiar with, an organization, an agency you're not familiar with, make sure you get familiar with it before you propose so that you understand. Because some of them can, they're just so different. Let's see, okay, DOD, SIBRs slash STTRs. So DOD is the largest of the SIBR organizations or agencies. Um, they have three to four phases. So there's a phase one, there's a phase two, there's a phase 2.5. I have heard about phase two extensions. It gets a little complicated. And you even have something where you can go direct to phase two. Because you'll see that on some of the topics, it'll say direct to phase two, which often means they want you to have your feasibility or proof of concept already finished, and then they just want to help you develop a prototype. Also, the proposal format for the DOD organizations is similar. So Navy and Army and Air Force, they're similar. They're not exactly the same, but they're very similar. You also can communicate most of the time directly to the TPOC, which is your technical point of contact, right? That's the person that is sponsoring the SIBR. That's the person that has said, I have this problem, whatever the problem is, and they are the one you can talk to about that problem. And we'll talk more about that in a minute. And the topics for DOD, they are problem-based, 
on, for example, for the Navy, they like to do top problems that currently exist in their current systems. Like this is a current issue they're having and they need it solved. So the cool thing about that is it, they try to do it so it will be filled in, like it will go out in the field. Um, and the topics are very structured. So they're, I'll show you a topic listing in a minute so you can see, or a little bit, so you can see exactly what that looks like. And I'll talk about that more. Open topics are subject-based. They're very broad. Um, I think it was last year, Congress mandated that if you have, if an agency has a CIBR program, then they have to have open topics. What that means is that every agency has done open topics different, even DOD. The, DO, the way DOD does open topics with each agency is doing them very different. You might have heard of something called AppWorks. It's kind of open topic. There's Army does a pitch competition. I want to say it's Army X, but they do a pitch competition for their open topics, or they were doing them. And um, Navy released their open topics in August, I believe, and they plan to do it annually. Basically, they're all figuring it out. So the open topics are going to be the most fluid where the rules change the most, at least currently. So keep that in mind if you want an open topic. And I'll tell you guys, I think open topics are harder because when somebody just says, give us a solution for human performance, I don't know what that means exactly. Like, what is the problem? Like, you have to figure out what the problems that they're having and you have to figure out the solutions. So I think they're a little more challenging. And SIBRs, the topics, when you, when the topics come out for a SIBR or STTR, you're gonna have, it's gonna come out day one, you're gonna have the pre-release. That's when the topics are released. So you know, right, I have all the information on there. 30 days after that is when you have, um, they're considered open, right? And that's where you can start submitting proposals. Now, after, during that 30 days to close, you cannot talk to the TPOC, or you can talk to the TPOC, but whatever you ask them, which is usually via email at that point, they will publish. So keep that in mind. And I, I've never seen them do conversations during the open phase. They will only do conversations through the pre-release, which is one to, what, 29-ish days. And then day 30 is when you can open, you can do your proposal submissions, and day 60 is usually when the topic is closed. So these are fast, but the proposals are shorter, so keep that in mind. And once you've done one, they get so much easier, because you know, the, the first one will be the hardest, honestly. It'll be the most challenging, but that's when you can work with Apex Accelerator, you can work with me, there's also a few other organizations to help you get on track. So what questions do you guys have now about SIBRs in general, especially the, the basic SIBR information? All right, well, it looks like the first question we got, and I'm not sure if you explained this, of what SIBR actually is. That's perfect. It is a small business innovative research here. I will. Oh, it's yeah, here we go. It's on the title slide, but I get it. It's it's hard to remember. Um, small business innovative research. Awesome. Thank you so much for that. Um, the next question we have is that the National Park Service have a SIBR. That's a great question, and I'm actually not sure. The government mandated that if you're if your agency's budget is over X amount, and I don't remember what X amount is, then you have to have a SIBR program. And I would guess the National Parks budget is pretty big. So it's very possible. I have not seen them at any of the um, SIBR conferences, mm -hmm. but I'm gonna look that up. That's a great question, thank you. <laughs> no problem, thank you for your question. Um, the next question is, what field do you have to be in um, in order to work with SIBR? Uh, a field that you're qualified to solve their problem. 
I think that's a good answer because there's all kinds of servers that we talked as we've talked about. DoD does a lot of tech, honestly. They do a lot of tech. Um, they do hardware, they do software, they're big into technology. So any field that answers the problem. And you can use, that's a great question, because you can use your experience as a reason why you should be awarded the CIVR. That's the great thing with CIVRs is that you don't have to have a past performance to be able to do them. Awesome, thank you for that, Tracy. Uh, the next question is, would it ever be, would a CIVR ever be awarded to a one employee, a one employee company? Yes, I've seen it done. I think it's a little hard to do that in a way because it's a really great opportunity to create a team and to work with others, but I have seen them awarded to one person. All right, and then another question was, where are they published? Oh, that's a great question, and I'm going to put a little pause on that because I'm going to show you a little bit later. Awesome. Um, okay, and then someone asked, what's the difference between CIVR and a contract? CIVRs are con, well, okay, hang on, let me back up a little bit. DOD CIVRs are contracts. I think some of the other ones call them grants, um, but for the DOD, it, it is a contract, a CIVR. Awesome, thank you, uh, let's see which I believe you can use for past performance if you go after a different contract. Okay. And does information, does this information apply to DOD opportunities only? I think you kind of addressed that with your previous answer. Um, no, it applies to any government agency that releases um, CIBR or STTR topics. That's not just DOD. Awesome. And then for different um, organizations or programs, how can we find out if they have a super program? Excellent question. I am going to give you that information further down. All right. Awesome. Well, it looks like that's all the questions that we have for now. If you do have questions, definitely keep them coming. We have another uh, Q&A coming up, so we'll be able to answer them then as well. Thank you, Tracy. That's all. Oh, thank you. Oh, I love these questions. Where was I? Here we go. Yeah. Okay. Q&A. All right. Perfect. So now we're going to talk about a pre cyber winning strategy. So when I first started learning about cybers and then I became a small business owner, you know, of course I wanted to get a cyber right away. That's not how it works because let's be real. This is the government. They like to have everything checked, their T's crossed, like everything. So the first step, which some of you already know about, is register and certify your company. So one of the big places, there's several things you need to do to register. There's several different places. However, one of the biggest one is SAM.gov. And that is where you get a cage code, which is where we asked the poll in the beginning, do you know what a cage code is? Do you have a cage code? You have to have a cage code in order to apply for a CIVR. I'm gonna give you a story though. When I um, first started my small business, my small tech business, I saw a, um, an open topic for AFWorks, right? Uh, that's Air Force. That's Air Force's open topic platform, I guess. It's how they do their open topics. And I said, you know what? I have this great idea. And like, you know, of course they're all great ideas, right? <laughs> it was a great idea. And I was going after it. And as I was going after it, I was trying to finish up my SAM.gov which try not to do that, don't do that. And, and so what ended up happening is by the time I ended up submitting, and I did submit it to AppWorks, um, the, and it was actually a presentation, which was how they were doing it then versus a proposal. Anyway, um, I didn't have a cage code. And in the writing was, with AppWorks, it said you, they highly advise, but you don't have to have a cage code. So I was just crossing my fingers, hoping I would get that cage code before I was actually awarded, if I got awarded. Long story short, I did not get the award for one, um, which I've heard a lot of people, like that's the problem with open topics. You don't know if anybody's actually interested. Um, and 
uh, my case code took quite a while to get back um, because I would make errors and do different things. And it took me a long time to even figure that out because I would just make silly errors. And I was talking to Kara, who you guys met in the beginning about it. And she said, well, you should work with us. It's the Apex Accelerator because they will help you. They will guide you through the certification process so you will get it done as quickly as possible because it takes time. You're going to fill out all the information and then the government's going to see if they like what you filled out. And if there's any errors, they're going to kick it back to you. And then it's going to go through processing again and that can go back and forth. So do yourself a favor and work with Apex Accelerator. It's free. They're happy to help. They're very nice people and they will get you on the right path very quickly. Um, but there's also other things that you need to register for before you can, before you start working on the cyber topics, and they will also help you with that. Value and capability statements. And I'm gonna. This is a little almost off topic, but I, someone that's working at TechRow, we do things like industry showcase, and we have these wonderful small businesses that come. However a lot of times they don't have a good capability statement or a one sentence saying what they do. And I have to tell you that it is the difference between have, talking to someone in the government that could be interested in your technology and them saying, oh, I wanna know more versus them just walking away. So do yourself a favor and have at least a one sentence, about, like one sentence statement saying what you do, who you serve and how you're different. And I'm gonna get into a little bit more why this is so important. You also want to make a capability statement. And this is a misnomer. I don't know why it's called a statement because to me a statement is a one sentence or maybe a paragraph. But a capability statement for a business and you can search on Google is often a one or two pager about what you do, about what, what your company does, what its expertise is, why somebody should talk to you basically. And I'm going to give you a bit of a pro tip on this one because it sounds really obvious, but it happens more times than I care to admit. Make sure your contact information is on these capability statements because um, they're often PDF documents. So make sure they're on there. Also on your website, please make sure you have contact information that actually goes to someone because for me, a tech pro, we will often, we will have a request from the DOD asking, oh, we need a company that does cybersecurity and they're experimenting with AI. I'm just making something up, right? Then we go and look for those companies. And if we find them on the web, you know, if we find a website or we, or we go and look them up, and we find them, that's awesome. But then if we can't find contact information, we can't connect them. So please make sure your contact information, like how somebody can contact you, so important. And then how, um, how you're different from your competitors. That's really important too, because that happens a lot when, just like we do, right? When we go to like, why do we want to go to Target versus Amazon, right? What's the difference or, you know, I'm buying a fridge. So like, what kind of fridge do you want to buy? Like how, why is this fridge different than that fridge? You want to be able to express that very quickly. And Apex, I believe can help um, with that too. They can help with um, doing some uh, analysis of your competitors. Okay. Building relationships. This is insanely important. I know Sibbers are you submit your proposal online, you find your topics online, you talk to people that are in different states. I totally get it. But the value of building relationships cannot be understated. So how do you do that? Well, when you have that, that sentence that I talked about, that capability statement, and don't overthink your capability statement, make it good enough, right? You have those so that you're able to communicate and have the same message over and over and over again. That really helps when you build relationships because people say, well, what do you do? And you can tell them very quickly. 
But a few ways to build relationships, especially locally. Here's some examples. Um, Central Florida Tech Row, of course. Um, we do a lot of events. We also have a newsletter that just started going out last week, and it, is, it has tons of information about small business funding opportunities. We work really hard to get that out. And at the end, you'll figure, you know, I'll put on here how you can sign up. Um, and you can upload your capability statement to Central Florida Tech Grove at the website. And we use that for matchmaking. So if we get a request from the DOD, we're able to match you. And you automatically become a member of the Tech Grove uh, Alliance, which is our, kind of our membership platform. Let's see. Um, oh, we also have webinars and we have Juice Bar and we have things virtually. So it, even if you're not in Central Florida, join anyway, because we have a lot of things that happen virtually. Um, Pulse. Uh, procurement, administrative, lead time. To be honest, I had to look up this acronym. Basically, a PALT, if you haven't been, is where uh, a government agency um, gets up and makes a presentation about the upcoming awards that they're expecting, not awards, the upcoming um, opportunities, right? And most of it are big opportunities. I mean, some of them are small business set aside, but if you haven't worked with the DOD, it's, it's not the best place to start. However, it's a great place to make, to meet people because most of these are, they're online. Uh, a lot of them are virtual too. They're a hybrid, but they're in person too. And if you go in person or you just join the call, you'll start to learn people's names. You'll start to like, figure out who they are. They will also often put their email addresses up. Um, a lot of times they don't record these events, so don't expect for you to register and then you get a recording afterwards. They often don't do that. Just a heads up. So make sure you attend, either virtual or in person. If you're in person, you are able to meet some of these government people, so you're able to start chatting with them. And people love to do business with people they know, right? It's just so important. And then. Um, you are also able to meet the other people in the room. So you can meet other partners, you can meet other business owners, sometimes you can even meet uh, primes. You can learn about what the government is interested in, um, things like that. It's, there are a lot of information, it's, it's awesome, but I will, I'm gonna give you guys a little bit of warning, sometimes they can be a little boring because they're just, they're a presentation about what's coming up, but they're still extremely useful. Um, there's also in Central Florida, there's something called TSIS, T-S-I-S, TSIS, I believe. And it is, um, they do major pulse there, but it is also a really, TSIS and ITSEC, I-T-S-E-C, S-E-C, sorry, I-T-S-E-C, is a great place. Mm -hmm. I'll clarify that in the end. Anyway, it's a great place to meet other people too. These are conferences that happen in Central Florida. But there's ones all over the United States. So if you're not in Central Florida, that's okay because they're all over. Leagues and socials. This is something I didn't know about until uh, a few years ago. So there's a lot of these social organizations that are not, they're not, the Navy doesn't sponsor them, the Air Force doesn't sponsor them, the Navy doesn't sponsor them. I mean, the, the Army. But what happens is that um, usually uh, uh, veterans will create some of these organizations or they'll be they'll create a branch of one of these organizations that's a social. Right. And you don't have to be a veteran to come. Sometimes they're like just show up and chat. These are great ways just to get to know people and just say hello. They're they're very social. So they're not such a professional setting. But I think they're amazing. And we have many in Central Florida, but they're all over the United States. So even if you're even if you're from Central Florida and you're traveling, you might be able to find one and then join. Uh, there's AUSA, for example. There's the Navy League. There's several of them. And if you join for our part two of this Cyber series, you will get an epic handout with that information and specifically where you can go to find out where they're meeting or how you can sign up. 
Um, there's also other membership groups, the NDIA, um, the Women in Defense, WID, I love that one personally, um, the National Center for Simulation, that's big here because we're a big simulation center in Central Florida, the Apex Accelerator, um, Tech Grove, we do a ton of events, AUSA, there's so many. And it's just a really great way. And what's going to happen is if you start going to these and you go to them in the same area, you're going to start seeing the same people over and over and over again. And that's actually great because they get to know you. They start to trust you. They start to say, oh, look, it's Bob. And they are really big into AI and cybersecurity. And so that's a great way to start getting in the community. Um, also, LinkedIn is getting really big for sharing information. Um, for example, events and happenings. Um, you can see the different contractors, primes. Um, some of the government representatives are on LinkedIn. Not all of them, but some of them are. Especially if they're small business, they'll often be there. For example, um, uh, Leslie Furto, who is with the Navy, she is on LinkedIn. So you can follow her. But it's a really good way to just stay up to date. And you'll start seeing the players even on LinkedIn. And you can comment and you can you know, send them a message. Building relationships, you can't go wrong. It's so important. Okay, so we talked about how to register and certify. We talked about the um, capability statement. We talked about building relationships. And now we're going to talk about education. So this is a great place to start here, this webinar. What are SIBRs um, and SCTRs? How do they work? Um, how do I get started? This is a great place. But there's a ton of information about SIBRs, and you're going to have a ton of questions once you start. So a really great place to start and something you have to do is educate yourself. And thank goodness, thank goodness for the internet, right? So these are a few sites. You might want to take a picture. Of, and I'll talk about the last one, which is a web address. I'll, I'll tell you about that in a minute. But these are a few sites that are fantastic for learning about SIVRs and STTRs. Oh, by the way, the reason that SIVRs is talked about way more than STTRs is that there is a lot more SIVR opportunities than there are STTRs. It's like people don't talk about STTRs as much, but it is the it's very similar. It's just the split, again, with education, usually an education institute. So if you do a, an STTR phase one, you have to do 40 percent has to go to the an educational institute. So you partner with them. Um, OK, so we have Cibber.gov. Great place to start. There's roadmap. There's eligibility information. They have good tutorials. So that's fantastic. You could even um, play the tutorials. If you have a great internet, you can play them in your car and just listen to the audio if you want. I know we're all busy. Um, defense Cyber STTR .mil. That is the DOD. That's there's a lot of stuff in there. Cyber and STTR guides. Like those are great. Then you have um, NavyCyber.com. I think they've done a really great job of disseminating information to. Um, they have specific information about Navy topics. They also have very good like how to even apply. They have some templates there. They have the BAA schedule. Sometimes I go there versus somewhere else because they'll update it very quickly. Um, that's also a great resource. They also have a good FAQ. So if you have a question, what the Navy did is that um, they took all the questions they've gotten about SIVRs and they answered them and they put them on their website. So if you have a question, that's a really good place to start. Then there's the um, DOD server STTR.mil. Um, and then this last one. So what I'm going to do for the part two is I'm creating this monster handout that will have some of this information on here, but it will have these links very specifically on that handout and more about education. So make sure you attend the next one. Um, so that you get that handout because it's going to be fabulous. It's not, I've never seen anything like this created yet. So uh, the last one, this one is very interesting. 
and I'm sorry, it's a crazy link. But this is the, they call it a, it's a listserv, but basically you can put your email, it'll come up with a form, you'll be able to put your email in, and you will get the updates for all the SIBR and SDTR topics right to your inbox. You won't get a pre-update. It's not going to say, hey, we're going to release SIBRs uh, in two weeks. It's not going to say that. It will say it's releasing today. So uh, that is your SIBR STTR mailing list. So I tell everybody, get on that and subscribe. Um, also, what you're going to want to do is if when you get serious about going after a SIBR topic, is you're going to want to go to any of these, really. Um, NavySibber.com has it. Um, Defense Sibber, STTR has it. All of them have um, the BAA schedule. And you're like, what is a BAA? That's an excellent question. <laughs> it's a broad agency announcement. But that is your SIBR schedule. That is when the topics are going to drop, right? That's, that's when they're happening. That's when the pre-release happens for those topics. And you're going to want to go in there and put um, and find the dates and then put calendar reminders. At least that's what I do. Put calendar reminders when the topics are going to open. And right now they're just showing 2023. Um, they're going to show 2024. And just so you know, 2024 for government, I think that means October. Anyway, because of fiscal year. So I've heard that um, the first 2024 topic, and this is, it's, I don't think it's super public knowledge, is supposed to drop end of November. So keep that in mind. But I haven't seen it on any of the BAA schedules yet. Okay. Oh, I'm going to go back. This is your time to take a screenshot. If you want to take a quick screenshot, um, three, two, one. Okay. <laughs> Um, Cyber Topics, Ooh, we're finally here. This is the, for pre-release. So remember, day one, Cyber Topic gets dropped and it is a pre-release, first 30 days, first 30, 29 days. Then the next 30 days are the open. So that means that you can submit a proposal and then they close at the end. So you only have 60 days to do a, um, a SIBR proposal, not even, because you don't want to do it at the end. Do not do that. Uh, do it five to 10 days before the topic closes, for sure. Because something will go wrong. Um, so the first thing you're wanting to do, so you have, you have all the things. Let's see, let's make sure. We have all the things. We have, you've registered. You're great. Maybe you've worked with Apex and you've figured that out. Um, you have your, your statements, like what you do, who you do it with, and why you're different. You're starting to build your relationships um, and you're educated, right? You've looked at stuff, you're educated about the SIBR program. All right, so you've done these things. You're ready. So now the topics have been released. Excellent. You've got your, you got your, you signed up for the list that we just talked about here at the bottom. Sorry, I'm jumping around, but at the list at the bottom, you signed up for that. So you got a notification, or maybe you have, you've put the dates in your calendar, you know, the talks released. Topics are released. They have dropped. So what you're going to want to do is go through all the topics and you're going to pick one or however many that fit your company's expertise, that fit where you want your company to go. Right. Um, if you are in cybersecurity, you probably don't want to pick anything that is going to deal with um, uh, microcomputers or um, that's going to deal with um, lasers, right? You want to pick something that's in your field, something that's going to help your company grow. And when you see the topics, so pick them out, and then you're going to take each topic, and you are going to read it, hopefully. And I advise you to read it again, and then I advise you to re read it again. So one of the things I do when I look at cyber topics is I print them out. I'm usually not a printout person, but these are super important. So I will print them out. I will get a highlighter and I will go through and I will read them because, and I'll go through a topic in a minute so you can kind of see, but there's a lot of detail and there's so many acronyms in these topics. 
so that I can figure out what I need to research. Is this really going to work? Um, maybe come up with brainstorm some solutions. And then you're going to look up the references because topics have references. And we're going to look at a topic in just a minute. So you're going to look up the references. And the same thing, make sure you know because what happens. So what happens from the TPOP side, right? Because they're the ones that are sponsoring the topic. It's taken them a year to get this topic published. They've had to do write-ups. They've had to justify their topic. Um, it's taken them a year. So they're ready for this problem to get solved. Then they, just so you know, like TPOPs don't get much funding to do a cyber topic at all. So they don't have a ton of time. This is more a labor of love. This is something they're passionate about and they need, right? So, and they have taken the time and the effort to get re uh, references that support the topic to say, you probably want to look in these directions. These are the things that are relevant. So always read them, always know the topic well. I don't think there's a better way to offend a TPOC if you don't actually look at the material. And then you're going to research your solution or proposed solution, right? Because you want you want to know, you want to be on the ball. And then you're going to chat with a TPOC. And what you do is you send them, there's usually an email, which I'll show you in just a second, where you can say, hey, um, I saw the cyber topic. It looks like you're going in this direction. This is absolutely something we can help with. We do this. I would love to chat with you more to make sure we're a good fit. Something along those lines. And you set up a time to chat. So you chat with the TPOC. They might give you some other information. Sometimes they'll even say, this is not a direction we were looking for. And that's, I think that's very kind when they do that because you're not wasting your time. Um, and then you make the decision uh, as a company, are you going to go for the proposal? Are you gonna spend the time and resources it takes to do it? Or are you not going to? So are you a go or no go decision to going after the topic? Oh, and that all needs to be done in the first 30 days. Oh, and you also want to think, do you need any partners? Do we need any SMEs, subject matter experts, to help you with these topics? I know this is an eye chart, um, but this is a topic. This is a cyber topic. Uh, it's open, I believe, right now. Um, and it is with the Defense Health Agency, DHA. And it's an example where they're going to have a title, right? This is about technology drive, 60 day runtimes and wearable devices and the objective. So they want you to invent or develop hardware and embedded software integrated. Into, I'm not going to go through the whole thing, but basically you're going to have an objective for each topic normally. Because it can all change, but right now, you have an objective. This is what most DOGs does. Objective, you have a description, which I cut off, um, but there's a huge description about what they, the topic. Then they're going to detail the phase one, two, and three often, like they did here. And you'll see phase one, because this was the phase one, so you bid for the phase one, um, is a proof of concept. So that's what they're looking for. And then they want a phase two prototype development. And then um, a phase three, which again, we talked about isn't exact or exactly cyber funding, but you need to talk about what you're going to do in a phase three and commercialization, even in your phase one um, proposal. And so phase three is about commercialization. Now you'll see on here, you have references. Again, these are really important. So these will start telling you. So this is um, a flying heart rate, monitored health. So I'm going to guess they want to increase the runtime of especially a heart rate monitor. I'm just guessing. But it doesn't say anything about a heart rate monitor up here, but in the references it does. So that's something I would probably ask the TPOX. I would say, do you have a specific wearable device, like heart rate monitor, that you're looking at. 
that we can start with. Um, they always have keywords. So when you search for a sieber, you can use the keywords. I cut those off. There was more here. Um, but they'll have several keywords. And now we have the tea pops. So we have um, Dr. Rachel Markwald, and then we have an email address. And Dr. Bar Bart Hold Hold Hodlick. I'm going to say Hodlick. Um, and then we have an email address. So you'd send an email, maybe to both of them and let them know that you wanted to talk to them about this and why you wanted to and why they should talk to you, right? Because remember, they have so little time that you wanna make their life super easy. Okay, I hope, hope everybody's still here because now we're at the Q&A. <laughs> so I would love to hear your questions about um, the bird topic. Well, it looks like they are still with us, <laughs> so we do okay. have. I know that was long. <laughs> um, yes, we do have a few questions. Um, one of them was, let me go back to it. Can you explain a little bit more the difference between SBIRs and STTRs? Yes, it's a great question. The main difference between SIBRs and STTRs is in STTRs you are required to work with usually an educational institute. So for example, um, like uh, UCF. So you have to work with UCF and it's usually um, 40%. So UCF would do 40% of the work and then your company could do 60% of the work and you split the proceeds to 40, 60. Now the cool thing with some of those, this is a little inside tip, is that some universities have a program where the the um, maybe your point of contact in the university, the person that you're mainly working with, they can submit a proposal to get the to get a grant for additional or even matching funds of the uh, of your project. So it can go twice as far because okay? universities like they're pricey, right? So it's to help mitigate that and increase innovation. So. Um, that's absolutely, that's a program that UCF has, but there are, there's other universities that do it. I think Indiana even has like a matching STTR program. I'm not 100% sure. But that's the big difference, is that you have to work with an educational institute, and I believe it has to be a nonprofit. All right, thank you for that, Tracy. Um, the next question is, are the only requirements for open topics that they must publish them, or do they have a, or do they have a requirement to take certain amount of open topics? They have to have an open topic. That's, I believe, the requirement. I have not read the, the specific language, but from what I understand, they have to have an open topic. So they could just have one open topic. And I, I think they, some places, some agencies might have done that last year. But this year, they're actually trying to be better about it and have better processes. Um, I really liked how the Navy did theirs. They did two info sessions and all kinds of stuff. Um, and they're just trying to figure out what fits. So it's really up to the agency how they want to handle it. Thank you for that. Um, the next question we have is, can you expand on what the matching funds from TechGrove looks like? TechGrove doesn't provide matching funds. Um, UCF has a program where their, their point of contact. So let's say that, um, that's a good one. Uh, the wearables, right? Let's use that as an example. So that wearable topic I was talking about. So let's say that you as a company are like, oh yeah, we can figure out this wearable program. We can make stuff last for 60 days, no problem. But I need someone that is an expert with batteries. And so you contact UCF, we get you in contact with um, a person that is excellent at battery and, you know, stuff. <laughs> Anyway, they're excellent with batteries, right? They know what to do. They know how to do, um, they're excellent with energy. So get them in contact with them. You work things out. You do an agreement, all kinds of stuff. And then what happens is that that person at the university that's excellent with batteries 
can submit a proposal um, to have the funds uh, matched by you by this grant program through UCF. So it's really not up to you. It's up to the person you work with at UCF to do that. Um, it is, I think it's like they have to be approved, but they only have so much money. Like it's a it's a little complicated, but it is an option. Thank you for that. The next question we have is, what are the best way you recommend getting connected to these social groups and membership groups for educational technology based grants? Sure. Um, well, it meant education technology. So that could definitely be in the training and simulation realm if you want to go that way, which is a lot of things here in um, Research Parkway by UCF in Central Florida. Um, so that's the good news because all those places I listed are a great place to start going. Um, if you want to get in the social groups, so um, LinkedIn is a good place to start looking for the ones I put in there. You can also just search for them on Google and put Central Florida, Central Florida AUSA, or um, I believe um, the Navy League. There's very specific times they meet normally. Um, I know the Army one happens the day of the pal their pulse, but right after. So there's really wonderful ways. Um, I'll go back to that relationship slide. If you want to take a quick picture, um, so you can take a quick screenshot if you want, um, the best thing you can do is, and if you're ready now, then do this, like go for this. But also the next web series, the next uh, series, part of the series, we are going to have a really excellent handout that details that has this information in more detail and it's a little more specific. Thank you, thank you. And just to also let you know, if you're on a device and you cannot take a screenshot, um, please be advised. Um, I stated a little bit earlier, if you weren't here to catch it, you will have, there is a copy of the slides in the GoToWebinar handout panel as well. So you're more than welcome to download that. And all of the links that are included in here are active links that you can go directly to. Um, so you will have that as well. And then it'll also be emailed to you after if you are still not able to download them from the GoToWebinar handouts panel. Um, and then after that, um, the next question that we have is, someone is asking, are these found on SAM.gov? And if so, what exactly do we type in to find them? I would go to, where is it? I, um, the topics are different. I would go to, you can find Navy topics even on NavySiver.com. Um, that defense cyber str dot mill. I believe those have a lot of the topics in there too. Um, you can just go Google open cyber topics, honestly, um, and they will come up. Uh, I they might be listed in sam.gov, but honestly, I've heard a lot of complaints about sam.gov's search. So. The pulse, I think, are even listed in SAM.gov, but I frankly have had a hard time even finding them. Um, so I would I would just look for that defense cyber sttr.mil or cyber.gov. It'll also have where to get the topics. And then someone asks, um, can our Apex team help us to connect with the university? I mean, I, I guess, right? They just have to, you can connect with them and they can help you connect with someone on the university side. If you're looking for someone to help you with a topic, like an expert, then I can help you with that. Um, we have actually someone that does that at UCF. Um, so I can connect you or uh, Steve or Cara know the people too. So we'd be happy to do that. But that's just within UCF. Yes. But there are also um, other universities. There's usually an outreach program with each university. Thank you. And then the next question is, does UCF have a channel for working on SIBRs or STTRs with local businesses? Yes. So again, 
you would need to contact you could contact me and ask me for something specific like that especially if you have something um, a subject matter expert that you're really looking to connect with that's a great way so you can do that with me you can do that with steve you can do with cara we would be happy to help thank you so much and then Let's see. I know the tech world does not fund cibers, but is the difference between the prize challenge? What's but what is the difference between the prize challenges and cibers? I think that's the question. Oh, I love this question. Thank you. Thank you for asking, because now I get to talk about prize challenges. <laughs> um, prize challenges are pretty awesome, and they're actually great for probably everybody on this call because they are non-FAR funding. What is FAR? It's basically a lot of regulations and all kinds of stuff that you have to follow. And um, big contracts are absolutely, especially DOD, big contracts are FAR-based. But TechRo, we specialize in non-FAR-based. And our, most of the prize challenges, all of them that I've seen, but I'm not gonna say all because who knows, there's probably an exception, are non-FAR-based. Sibbers are non-FAR-based. And that, what that means is that they are an excellent way for small businesses to, um, for one, you can, some of them you win cash, um, you start building fantastic relationships. Like price challenges are amazing, but they're not sippers. They are different. Um, they actually have less hoops to go through. A lot of them do require a cage code, especially if they're doing um, prizes, but sometimes they don't. Sometimes they don't even require a page code. You show up, show up, and you try to solve the problem. They're fantastic. And some of them, for example, we did one with the, I think it was with the Army recently. And that one was really cool because it was over the weekend. And so you ended up interacting with all these wonderful people. Um, yeah, price challenges are fantastic. You can actually go to challenge.gov. Challenge.gov. And you can see um, all the prize challenges. And TechRobe is doing one. I don't know if it's open. They did an information session. So you can go, um, if you send me an email, which you'll get, you'll see my contact information at the end. Um, I can send you information about that if you don't have it. But I believe it's on our events page at TechRobe also. Um, about the information session. So we have that, and I believe, I want to say it's going to close in December, but I'm not sure. But yeah, don't challenge.gov, go there. There are some really interesting challenges there. And again, it doesn't require past performance. Some of them don't even require a cage code. It is a great way to get started. And that's the purpose, actually, is to solve problems in an innovative way because the government recognizes, and one of the reasons my position even exists is because the government's like, we need more innovation. And these big companies, they're great. They can, they can make production stuff and that's fantastic, but they're slow with innovation. We need the small businesses that are really innovative and agile to help us. Awesome. Well, I hope that answered your question. That was a pretty good answer. Um, <laughs> the next question that we have is, when are these contractors events happening? Oh, good question. All the time. Seriously, they're happening all the time. Um, TechRove, when's their next event? Um, you can go to their website and you sign up, which I'm going to talk to you guys all about that in a minute. But you go to their website and you go to the contact us and you fill in your information and you'll get emails about all our events. Um, sometimes we'll even promote um, outside events that are our partners. Let me see what our next one is. We have events all the time. Um, I'm looking, I'm trying to look right now. You guys put me on the spot, which is good. Let's see. Uh, we. This one's hard to see. Anyway, we have them. I'll look them up here in a second and I'll try to give you guys an update. But we have events all the time, but it's not just us. The NDIA, NDIA also has events. Um, where was I? Where were the relationships? Here we go. Um, the NDIA, the Women in Defense, um, National 
Center for Simulation just did an event a few weeks ago. They're happening all the time, honestly. The league events usually happen once a month. There's a lot going on. All righty. Well, that is definitely a good thing. So there's multiple different opportunities for you. And it looks like that is all the questions that we have. Um, if I'm seeing that correctly, if you have any more questions, if you've been thinking about your question and you have not typed it, um, now is the time as we'll be coming to the end of our Q&A uh, section here. Let's see, any other questions? If you have no more questions, you can just go ahead, drop a no in the chat, that's totally fine. Um, and then we can go ahead and just move on. Okay, excellent. Okay. Yeah, it looks like we don't have any other questions. Okay, well, we're not quite, we're almost done. So hang on, they might have a few more. I hope so, I love these questions. You guys are doing great. Um, so, Sivir, so let's say the Sivir topics. So this is when they're pre-released and open. What do you do? Right. You've decided you're going to go for the topic. You're like, yes, this fits. This fits the company vision. We can do it. We're willing to dedicate the resources to doing a proposal. So what do you need? Well, you need to figure out your partners, which we already talked about, and your subject matter experts, your SMEs. So if you need any partners who your SMEs, if you need any of those, like what those would look like. And you're going to include those in your proposal because you want to tell when you do a proposal, you're telling a story. Right. You're saying how you can solve the problem and how you can do it really well. Right. And what you're going to do to solve the problem. Then um, you're going to have a you're going to either get a proposal template or you're going to create one. I get this question, where do I get a proposal template? There's a few templates on Navy.gov, but a lot of people end up creating their own. I think you can buy some from different consultants, but I don't have a good one to recommend. Um, Apex might have some pointers on that one. And then you're gonna write your proposal. Um, and then a good idea is to do a proposal review. So when you do big government proposals, you do something called, um, a lot of them call them gates, where you do different reviews at different times. You don't have to do that for a sitter, but you do, it's, I highly advise you to get your pro proposal reviewed by someone. Um, because it's very easy to make a mistake, right? And it's very easy to talk about something that you already know the answer to, but you haven't explicitly explained it so somebody can understand it, right? or somebody that's not you can understand it. I, at least I have, sometimes I do that. So it's important to get that proposal reviewed, whether it's by um, an expert, because there are people that offer um, that service. Um, I don't know if Apex offers that service, but sometimes it's just getting someone to read it to make sure that they can even understand what you're talking about, whether they're an expert in the field or not. And then the biggest thing, Submit before that close. But what I mean by that is submit at least five business days before that proposal, before that topic closes. Because the odds that something are gonna go wrong, especially your first time, are very high. So do yourself a favor, because if you try to submit after that close, one, I don't think you can submit. Two, it's just everything, it'll get thrown out. Everything you've done, gone. So make sure you get it done before the submission date. This is not something you want to put off, getting these proposals done. Although they're a little difficult, right? Because you have to do your regular job and you have to do a proposal now, but still. Once you've done the first one, they get easier because you can reuse some of the things that you've already done. You can reuse some graphics, things like that. The first one will be the hardest one. It will take the longest. That's why I wanted you to really get ready to do a proposal. Get ready to do a sipper before you do the sippers. Uh, let's see what else. That's the big stuff. Just make sure you submit before you close. Um, you also want to look at your pricing. Um, and there's some information about that online too. But there will be a max amount for the sipper. Never go over the max amount and don't go super, don't go that much under the max amount either, is what I've been told. Um, and then it's closed. And then you get to wait and see if you get awarded. 
and they try to turn those around pretty quickly, but it's the government. Sometimes they do, sometimes they don't. Remember, the government doesn't work a ton during December, so always keep that in mind, but I don't, anyway. Um, and thank you. Thank you to everybody that's been on here. You guys have stayed on here. I really appreciate it. This is some contact information for you. So the QR code in the top right is the central, I mean, the Central Florida Tech Groves information. And that's where you can subscribe and you can get that wonderful newsletter about different small business funding opportunities, including price challenges. And um, the other QR code by my name is my LinkedIn. If you want to go ahead and connect via LinkedIn, that'd be amazing. And you have my email address, my cell phone number. If you have questions about Sibbers, let me know. Like I'm happy to help. And what I'd love to do is I love to take the questions that are often asked or even some that aren't often asked, and get the answers so that I can share them with other people. But so, you know, the, the questions change all the time, and the SIBR program changes all the time. So make sure you stay up to date. That's why I really wanted to give you that avenue to educate yourself, because it does change a lot, especially those open topics. They're really fluid. And that's about it. Um, make sure that you sign up for the second workshop which I think we're gonna show you how to do that in a minute because you're gonna get a fantastic handout, okay? It's, it's gonna be amazing. Um, and we're gonna talk about pro tips and things like that for your phase one and to get a phase one. And we'll go a little more in depth on that. And thank you everybody, this has been amazing. All righty, well thank you so much, Dr. Tracy. We appreciate you for being with us here today. And I'm sure that everyone here, um, hopefully you all guys got something useful out of this. If you did, just drop it in the chat. Um, just say thank you, Dr. Tracy. We are so grateful to have you here presenting today. Um, so stay here and hang on because we do have some things that we do wanna share with you um, towards the end. So, uh-oh moving a little too fast. So as Dr. Tracy just mentioned, um, this is the first part to a three-part series. The next part is the tips and tricks to a phase one um, SBIR award. Um, so if you are interested in attending that, and like she said, the little birdie told me that there will be some exclusive handout um, that will be able to be retrieved at that um, next se session. So if you have not already, you can either scan the QR code, download the um, PowerPoint presentation once you get it um, or through the handouts panel and click that link there um, and you'll be able to register for the next session that we have. That one is a webinar as well, also taking place from 1 to 3 p.m. Um, on October 24th, so about two weeks from today. And then the third session is our SBIR expert panel. Um, and I hear that we have some exciting people that we have um, to join us on that panel, which will be some more news on that will be coming soon. Um, but definitely would recommend if you have attended today, if you, the information that you got here today was helpful and you're ready to take the next steps in your cyber journey, definitely go ahead and register for those next two there. Now, more education resources. So the Apex uh, Accelerator at UCF, um, we are very geared towards helping you um, and making sure that you have the resources necessary in order to succeed um, along this journey. Um, and so we do have some resources available. Um, you can see we have our SBDC and Apex statewide trainings um, that happen that are like these webinars, these workshops that help you with business development, government contracting, different areas um, to assist you in your business. Um, and then we also have a few of these other upcoming events. There's an SBA workshop that is actually taking in place in person tomorrow for veteran-owned small businesses to learn about the surplus program. So if you are a veteran-owned small business and are able to attend that tomorrow at 1 p.m., would highly recommend it would be a good networking opportunity for you to be able to meet the senior area manager, Ed Ramos, from the SBA. Um, we talked about the second phase of the, S the Cyber Series Tips and Tricks to get a phase one award. Um, and then we have an expert lending panel that will also be in person um, to talk to you about how to get funding for your business as well. So you can register online using that link there. Um, and also, um, we talked about this a little bit earlier, but if you are not a client of ours, we definitely recommend that you become a client because not only do you get access to these webinars and workshops and one-on-one -on -one consulting, but we have other resources that are specifically for our clients. Um, and one of them is Gabology. Gabology.com um, has a 
host of different uh, trainings, workshops, and webinars as well um, that help government contractors and um, different areas in business. And I actually did look on there before this webinar today, and they do have some information on there related to CIBR. Um, it looks like it's pretty updated as well. They updated it in post 2023. So that is a free resource if you are a client um, of us. So if you want to take advantage of the Gabology, go ahead and register to become a client, and we can get you connected with that. And then the last thing, I mentioned this earlier when we first got on, uh, we would greatly appreciate your feedback. If you take a look in the chat box, I have sent a link to a survey. I'll send it there again for you all just in case. Um, we ask that you please go ahead and complete that online survey. It allows us to be able to improve the future webinars and make sure that we're giving you all the best experience that, um, and making sure that you're getting what you're coming for. Um, and it helps us to identify areas of opportunity to improve. Um, so you can either click the link in the chat box or it will be also sent to you in an email that you can complete as well. Um, it should take no more than about 30 seconds to just tell us a little bit about how you enjoyed today. And then after that, we have our Apex Accelerator team. So if you are looking to get in touch with one of the uh, team members from the Apex Accelerator, uh, please go ahead and reach out to us. This is our contact information here. You have Kara, Steve, and myself. And then very lastly, um, as I was speaking about before, getting registered as a client, it's just as simple as that going ahead and clicking that link or going to floridaapex.org and registering to become a client with us. Again, that is at no cost to you and no obligation. So we thank you all so much for being with us here today. I don't see any other questions that we have in the chat box. Dr. Tracy, I see a lot of thank yous. People enjoy this webinar. They're looking forward to the next ones. Um, so we thank you all and we hope that you all have a great rest of your day. Thanks, everybody, and I hope to see you at Tech Grove soon.